please have a seat and make yourselves comfortable. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, and so it's Family Sunday, although it's the last one for this particular year, uh, because in September, our kids will be going back downstairs, and we fall back into sort of a, an academic calendar, if you will. Uh, but we have our kids upstairs with us today, and so I thought today uh, we would jump into Joe. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to do Joe with our kids. What we are going to do is a familiar story. It'll be one that's very familiar to probably most adults if you spent any part of, of your life in church. Probably also very familiar to our kids. If you're a part of our youth group, it should be super familiar to you. Um, but I think there are things that we can always pull out of Scripture if we go just a little bit deeper. We talked about that last, last week. We talked about how uh, God's Word is like this diamond that has all these different facets. And every time you turn it and you look at it from a little different, different angle, if you shine light just a little bit differently, you see these new sparkles and you see these, these new things bouncing off and, and it's brilliant and it's beautiful. And so we're going to look today at a story uh, that you might know as Samson. Right? Samson. And I thought it was fitting if we did Samson, because I know that when, when you come in each week and you sit in your seats and you look up here and you think, now there's a, there's a specimen, uh, and, and, and maybe I remind you of Samson, <laughs> with, without the hair. Okay, if you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, Judges chapter 13, and while you're turning there, listen, moms and dads, part of the, the, the uh, reason for Family Sunday is because we want our kids to see what adult church is like, right? When they leave here and they go downstairs and they have arts and crafts and snacks and games, like that's cool, that's fun, that's age appropriate. But what we know from research is that there will come a day when our students are no longer a part of student ministry and they now have to go to adult church and oftentimes uh, young adults will say, what is this thing? What is this thing you do where everyone just sits and listens and, and they're bored by it? So we want our kids to be in church and understand that it's not always arts and crafts and snacks and games. That sometimes there's some deep study and good learning to be done. But moreover, this gives all of us as families an opportunity to leave this place today and be talking about the same thing. We're, we're reading the same scriptures today. We're going to be learning the same story today. We're going to be learning the same truths, and so we have an opportunity, not only today, but maybe throughout this whole week, to be talking with our children about the very things that God will lay on our hearts today. And so I would just ask you, would you pray with me now? Our Father in Heaven, we are asking you uh, to, to move powerfully amongst us today, God. Let your spirit move in such a way that you are speaking to every individual in the room. Lord, certainly you have something to say to me, and it may be different from what you have to say to my wife or my sons or my brothers and my sisters, but Lord, you have something to say to each one of us. And so I pray that you would speak to us. I pray that you would make us receptive to what you have to say. And God, I pray that we would not just be at church. But that we would, we would embrace this opportunity to commune with the living God. And that we would leave here today different than when we came in. God, we don't want to know about you. We want to know you. I don't just want facts. I want intimacy. And I'm asking you to work today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Judges 13. We're not going to read every single line because Judges has uh, Samson's story in chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And so that's a little bit longer uh, than I usually go. No jokes. <laughs> so we will do a little bit of bouncing. Here we go. Judges chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they did not have any children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you've been unable to have a ch uh, children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any of the forbidden foods. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. Well, there's a wonderful promise. Here we have this older man and his wife. She's unnamed. We don't know why. But this older man and his wife who have been unable to have children. 
And we've talked about this many times, whether it's Abraham and, and Sarah or other couples like uh, Elizabeth. We've talked often about how in this culture, a woman's ability to produce a child for her husband, and we know it takes two to tangle, right? But a woman's ability to produce a child was, was really sort of her identity. It was her worth. It was her value. And so having children was a big, big deal. And so here's another couple who has grown old. They don't have any children. And yet the Lord sends a message to them and says, but you will have a child. You're going to have a son. And your son's going to be special. Your son's going to be a Nazarite, which means that he's going to be dedicated to the Lord. And while the scripture pointed out a couple pieces, let me go just a little bit further with what a Nazarite was. A Nazarite really had uh, essentially four conditions on their life, if you will. A Nazarite never ate or drank alcoholic, uh, alcoholic drinks or anything that came from the grapevine. Okay? So even what we did today when we had grape juice, Nazarites would not have partaken in that because it came from the grapevine. So it wasn't just alcoholic drinks, but it was grapes, it was raisins, it was uh, grape juice. Nazarites didn't touch anything from the grapevine. A second thing was that they never cut their hair or, or shaved their beards. A third thing was they never touched any dead bodies of any kind. And you might think, well, that's not so weird. But even animals, they didn't touch any dead bodies. Now, there is some uh, discussion among scholars about whether Nazarites were vegetarians because they couldn't touch any dead flesh, or if there was an exception, and more likely they were probably able to eat meat, and especially considering the fact uh, that there were offerings that were made to the Lord, and so Nazarites were probably allowed to go through and make those offerings. But in any case, you're not supposed to touch the dead bodies. And the fourth thing for a Nazarite was your life was really to be set apart for the Lord. You dedicated yourself to serving God. God. Now, if you think about that, in a time when people didn't really have clean water, and so most people, what they drank was, was wine, and they drank wine because the alcohol made it a little bit safer, and they didn't get some of the diseases uh, from, from waterborne uh, pathogens and such. And, and so most people drank wine, except not the Nazarites. Most people kept themselves uh, uh, well-groomed, and so maybe they had a beard, but they would keep it nice and trimmed. Uh, they might keep their hair trimmed up. Not the Nazarites. The Nazarites look like, actually like a lot of folks today, to be honest with you. <laughs> Nazarite beards are back, I think. Also, they, they, they didn't touch dead bodies for anything, and you might say, well, I don't know if that's weird. Well, think about it. It means uh, no, no furs to make blankets or to make coats or to make clothing. Uh, to make rugs and carpets. It means you're not using uh, the bones of animals to make tools. And, and so these Nazarites, they were different. They were obviously different. Anybody who saw a Nazarite would be like, man, that guy's different. And we're going to circle back to that a little bit later about why. Why would that be important to the Lord? But we'll come back uh, as we get toward the end of today's message. Okay? Uh, let's go to verse 24. Chapter 13, verse 24. So God's made this promise that, that Manoah and his wife are going to have a child. The child's to be a, a, a Nazarite. Verse 24 says, When her son was born, she named him, what she named him? Samson. And the Lord blessed him as he grew up. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. I want you to hold on to the word began as we work our way through today's message. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Roll over, if you will, to Judges 14. So Samson is a little bit older. He's, he's grown now. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. And when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. They said, isn't there even one woman in our tribe that is one Jewish woman, one Israelite, or among all the Israelites that you could marry? Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? 
But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good. She looks good to me. You know, it's interesting to me that for a second week in a row, the Lord seems to be bringing this message to the surface. For the second week in a row, we seem to be um, reminded that God has said, I don't want my people to build deep, intimate relationships with unbelievers. It's not good for you. I want my people to build deep, intimate relationships with believers. We talked about this last week. doesn't mean you can't have non-Christian friends. Or that we don't go into the world and minister to people who aren't Christians. Because otherwise, how would they ever hear about Jesus? They need Christians to tell them. But our closest, our most intimate friends, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our husbands, our wives, need to be godly men and women. And look, if we had more time, I'd open this up and have people come up and give testimonies, and there would be people one after another, after another, after another, after another, who would come up here and tell us about the heartbreaks in their own lives because they pursued a man or a woman who did not love the Lord. And so if you're a single person, if you're a young person, you still have time to make the right decision. We talked last week about how moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, let's be praying for our kids that God would lead them to the right partner, the one that he has ordained for them, to be on a partnership on mission for Jesus. And as I said last week, I'm not just talking about boyfriends and girlfriends. I'm talking about your closest friends. The people you spend the most time with. The people you hang out with the most. Those people should be godly men and women. And not just youngsters. That's for all of us. And we're going to see how that plays into the story today. We also see here that Samson is like many of us when we were young. He doesn't invite his parents into a discussion to talk about this young lady that he's met who seems to be very attractive to him. He doesn't invite them into a conversation. Samson seems to be like many young people who, who think they got their act together. They know what they want. They know what they need. They don't really need to talk to mom and dad. And so what Samson does is he comes home and he says, hey, I found a girl. Get her for me. You get me what I want. I wonder if there are any parents in the room who have heard that. I want something, you get it for me. Now I know that in your families, your children come home, they say, Mother, Father, I've been drawn to this new sparkly, shiny thing, but I'd love to hear your wisdom on whether it's going to be healthy. Or not. <laughs> Samson's not so different than you and me. He did not invite his parents into a conversation. And even though he didn't invite his parents into a conversation, they still had something to say. I wonder if our young people have parents like that. Right? It's easy for us to, to point at the young folks, but I wonder if young people have parents where even though you don't ask mom and dad what you think, they tell you anyway. Anyone have parents like that? <laughs> So Samson said, hey, look, I found this girl. Man, she is beautiful. <clears throat> she comes from, you know, the other, other uh, town. She, I know she worships other gods and whatnot, but man, she's really beautiful. So look, Mom, Dad, get her for me. And then Mom and Dad said, well, well now hold on a minute. I'm not sure that's the best idea. In fact, and I, I imagine they had a conversation, and at some point it concludes with, uh, isn't there anybody in our entire land Who's appealing to you? No. I want what I want. And so Samson did not listen to his parents' wisdom. Instead, what he did is he pursued his own desire rather than pursuing the Spirit of the Lord who had begun to work inside him. 
See, that word begun, began, it's important here because the Lord's work was not completed yet, but Samson pursued his own desire. And as I thought back on my own life, and maybe this will resonate with others, I think of the times when either I or people I've known, um, they wanted what they wanted instead of maybe what the Lord wanted for them. And so they wanted that boyfriend or girlfriend. They wanted uh, to, to hang out with that other group of friends. They wanted that new video game. They wanted that new cell phone. They wanted that particular car. They wanted those particular clothes. They wanted that particular job. They wanted to be on that travel team or in that dance club. They, they, they wanted to go to this school. Because as human beings, we are that way. We want what we want. Judges 14, verses 5 through 9. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the, the vineyards of Timnah. By the way, uh, I didn't put this in my notes, but it's just striking me now. What was going on with Manoah and his wife? I, I mean, Samson said, look, I want this woman over here. Mom and Dad said, look, I don't think she's right for you, son. In fact, I think she's probably the wrong woman. She's probably going to lead you to your destruction, but okay. <laughs> Let us run over and make it happen. And, and, and I know that rings true for me because I'm a softie. I told my sons, don't ask for another sleepover until school starts. And we've only had five since I told them. <laughs> so they're on their way to get this woman. Verse 5 once again. As Samson and his parents were going down to Timnah, a young lion suddenly attacked Samson near the vineyards of Timnah. See, if you ask for enough sleepovers, a lion will attack you. <laughs> At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Don't miss that phrase. At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. He did it as easily as if it were a young goat. Interesting phrase, right? I I've often thought of how easy it is to tear a young goat limb from limb and rip its jaws open. And... So he, he did it like it was just a young goat. But he didn't tell his father or mother about it. Huh, I wonder why. Didn't think he should tell mom and dad. Verse 7, when Samson arrived in Timnah, he talked with the woman and was very pleased with her. Verse 8, later when he returned to Timnah for the wedding, so now they're all the way in, man. He's getting married to this woman. They're on their way back to Timnah for the wedding. Uh, but on the way, Samson turned off the path to look at the carcass of the lion. And he found that a swarm of bees had made some honey in the carcass. He scooped some of the honey into his hands and ate it along the way. He also gave some to his father and mother, and they ate it. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey from the carcass of a lion. This lion attacked Samson. Samson defeated the lion. But where did Samson's strength come from? came from the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. His strength came from the Lord. And, and, and you would think that Samson would want to go home and celebrate that with mom and dad. Mom, dad, you're not going to believe what happened. I was walking down, because i got to tell you, if I, if I whipped the lion, I'd be telling everybody everywhere. I would actually get on social media just to brag that story. Mom, Dad, I was walking down the road and, and a lion jumped out, but I grabbed it and I, boy, I ripped its jaws open. Samson's strength came from the Lord. You know, I, I wonder if one of the reasons why Samson didn't tell his mom and dad what had happened is, is maybe he just didn't have a very close relationship with them. Maybe they didn't talk very much. Maybe Samson was kind of isolated and he didn't really have meaningful conversations with his family. I don't know that to be true, but I just wonder, and I do know it's true in our culture today. It may not be true of your family, and I pray that it's not, but I know that in too many families, we just don't have deep and meaningful conversations with our kids with our families. And it's not just because moms and dads don't do it with the kids, but the kids aren't willing to do it with moms and dads, and so our relationships are shallow oftentimes.
and, and there seems to be some pride in Samson. See, I, I think the reason that Samson didn't tell his mom and dad that he had killed the lion is because he didn't want them to know where it was because on the way back to Tinda, notice what he does. He wanders away. And the scripture doesn't tell us that he told his mom and dad where he was going because if they knew about the lion, my guess is when Samson said, hey, mom, dad, I'll meet you guys in town. I'm just going to head over this way for a few minutes, but I'll meet you in town. My guess is his mom and dad would have said, no, don't go there. Don't go to that place of temptation. Don't go to that place of danger. Don't do it, Samson. But they didn't know. And so he wanders off. And why? We have to think, why would he do that? Like, who wants to go and, and, and smell a, a, a rotten, dead animal? But I think Samson's pride got the best of him, and I think he went over there to kind of celebrate his own victory, celebrate his strength and his, his manhood and, and what he had accomplished. Look what I did. And isn't pride a trap? Isn't it so often a trap? Because here's what happens to Samson. As he goes over to see the lion and, and celebrate his accomplishment and what he had done, let alone the fact that it was the Spirit of the Lord who became powerful, uh, uh, powerfully came upon him. But he goes to celebrate what I've done. Look what... Oh, honey. There's a, a beehive and, the, and there's honey, golden, delicious, sweet honey dripping. And, and Samson sees the honey. And so now he's really in a trap. And uh, funny enough, I think through this whole story, Samson seems to have trouble with honey, doesn't he? <laughs> and so Samson, the Nazarite, who does not touch a dead thing, it's down low. And he reaches into the belly of this carcass. And, and he scoops up some honey. And he enjoys the honey. And in doing so, is being disobedient to the Lord. He's breaking a vow to the Lord. And, and so he takes this honey. And oh, by the way, he then brings some honey back to his mom and dad. But he doesn't tell them where it came from. Now, Giving honey to his mom and dad was really not a problem because they didn't make a vow. They could eat the honey. If it came from a dead thing, it didn't really matter for them. Samson was the Nazarite. But had he told his mom and dad where he got the honey, they would have said to him, Samson, you did not belong there. You weren't supposed to be there. And you're not supposed to touch dead things. And so Samson chose to not tell them, which is a lie of omission. See, sometimes we lie by the things we do say, and sometimes we lie by the things that we don't say. When we don't give the full story, when we don't give the full truth. And I think we have all done that. Verses 12 through 13. Samson said to them, Oh, uh, I, I should fill in some blanks here. So after they eat the honey, they kind of arrive in the town, and there's going to be a big celebration. Weddings in those days were a big deal. Real big deal. Like everybody from the town came to celebrate the wedding. It would go on for several days. It was a massive party. Uh, there were events that led up to the wedding. There were events after the wedding. So it's a big deal. And the bride and groom were going to be celebrated big time. I mean, they were the center of attention. They were in the spotlight. The bride and groom were the main event. And so Samson, he, he's, the, he's the guy. He's getting all the attention as they draw near to this wedding. And in fact, the scripture says that uh, he had a, a, a bridal party of 30 groomsmen. There are 30 guys who are going to celebrate and hang out with and make much of Samson. But that's not enough for him. Having the wedding and, and being the groom and 30 guys in the bridal party and the whole town coming together, it's not enough for Samson. Not enough for him at all. So in verse 12, Samson said to the, to the men in particular, he said, hey guys, let me tell you a riddle. If you saw my riddle during these seven days of celebration, I'll give you 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of festive clothing. But if you can't solve it, then you must give me 30 fine linen robes and 30 sets of clothing. 
You see, Samson being in the spotlight, getting attention, it wasn't enough. Samson's desire is for the beautiful woman, even though she's dangerous. Samson's desire is for honey, even though it's in the belly of a dead thing. Samson's desire now is for more attention on himself. Hey, hey, I got a riddle. I got a riddle that I, none of you can solve. You know why? Because I'm the smartest. I'm the cleverest. None of you can solve my riddle. Not only am I the strongest, look at my muscles, but I'm also the cleverest and the smartest. And so Samson always has to be the S. Smartest, cleverest, strongest. And so he tells the men this riddle. And in doing so, he says, hey, let's make a wager. Let's, let's make it fun. If you can't solve the riddle, you guys give me some really nice clothes and lots of them. I want 30 of these and 30 of these, and they got to be like, really, they got to be, uh, uh, well, I'm about to date myself. They got to be like guests. Yes. No. Yes. Um, they got to be, Lord forbid, I should say Levi's. <laughs> what? Okay, all right. They got to be like designer top notch stuff. And so, once again, we can see that, that Samson has an appetite for the finer things. And, and let me just say at this point, if I may, there's nothing wrong with you and I enjoying good gifts. <coughs> God gives good gifts to the people he loves. The problem that you and I have is that sometimes we enjoy the gift more than the giver. And so the story plays out in the uh, Philistine men. They, they spend days trying to figure out this riddle. They can't figure out the riddle. And they don't want to have to give up their stuff. So they go to Samson's fiance and they say, hey, listen, you're one of ours. You're one of our people. You need to go and figure out the riddle. You need to find the answer. So she goes and she whines and she pouts and, and she uses her feminine powers. And, and, and she gets Samson to give the answer, which, of course, she goes back and delivers to the men. The men come to Samson and they say, Samson, it's the seventh day and, and we have an answer to your riddle. Here's the answer to your riddle. And Samson says, what? You could not possibly have figured that out. You know how you figured that out? And, and this is great, by the way. Look uh, with me at Judges 14, starting in verse 18. Samson replied after this. He said, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have solved my riddle. And then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed 30 men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. But Samson was furious about what had happened, and he went back home to live with his mother and father. So his wife was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. A couple things happened here. One, again, Samson follows his own desire. This time it's for anger. This time it's for revenge rather than following the Lord. He also calls his fiance a cow. <laughs> if you leave here with nothing else today, <laughs> single men, married men, it's not a good idea to refer to your wife as a cow. <laughs> but in doing so, I think we're seeing something about Samson's heart. See, Samson's been wounded. I'm the smartest. I'm the cleverest. Nobody can figure out my riddles. And when the men dig, he's like, somebody's got to pay. Somebody here is going to pay. He forgets the fact that he was foolish to make the wager. He was foolish to tell the riddle. He's been foolish all along, and he doesn't see his own responsibility. But instead he says, my wife's a cow. And then he knows he owes these men some robes and some linen. And so rather than depart with what is his, which would be honorable and right, he goes over here and he kills 30 guys. And he takes their clothes and he brings them back and he goes, here, here's the 30 garments that I owe you. So Samson is just all over the place here, constantly giving into his own desires, constantly giving into his own anger. And then he does what people so often do. After he loses the wager and the other men figure out the answer, 
he like stops his feet and he pouts and he goes home to mom and dad. And because he didn't deal with his problem in a godly way, because he didn't open a conversation, but instead he pouted and stopped and went away, because he remained silent and didn't have anything to say, because of that, the woman he loved was given to his best man. And she's now married, and she's gone, and Samson can't have her. But eventually, after he's done pouting, he decides to go back, and he's going to find her. And when he does, he finds out that she has been given away. And you can tell how Samson's going to respond. He's mad again. So when he finds out that she's been given away, he, he, he asks the father, what happened? Why would you give her away? I, I know he was mad, but I came back. I want her. Where is she? Father-in-law said, well, I, 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 I thought you left forever. I, I thought you were going to hate her because of what she did. So I, I, I let her marry somebody else, which seems kind of reasonable, but not to Samson. So what Samson does is he goes out and he gets 30 foxes. And he takes the foxes and somehow he ties their tails together. And then he, he, he puts a torch in, in the, the string that he used for the, the, the tying of the tail. And he lights the torches and he sends these foxes out into the field. And there's these 30 foxes who are probably absolutely terrified with their tails half lit on fire. And they're running every which way. And as they run through the fields, they burn up all the crops. All the crops. The olives, the grain, everything. And the Philistines are left with essentially nothing. Not to mention whatever happened to the foxes. Because Samson pursued his own heart again. His anger. His revenge. Instead of pursuing the Lord. Then the Israelite men, they came and they tried to say, Samson, look man, you got to chill out. you you got to cool off. You're bringing all kinds of trouble. Because every time you do something, the Philistines make it harder on us. So can you just lay low and back off? Samson says, I won't. So they tie him up and they're like, look, we're not going to kill you. It would be wrong for us to kill you, but we are going to give you to the Philistines. We're going to let them deal with you. Chapter 15, verse 14. Samson tied up by the, the Jews now. As Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came shouting in triumph, but the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and killed a thousand Philistines with it. And then, and, and then Samson said, uh, and, and here essentially he wrote a song. Uh, I, I think he probably rapped. Okay, if I had to guess, probably a rap song. And I'm sure in Hebrew this probably rhymes. With the jawbone of a donkey, I piled them up in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed all these peeps. <laughs> Verse 17 says, when he finished boasting... He threw the jawbone away, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. Did you notice yet again, Samson was tied up, and he didn't break the ropes until something happened. He was tied up, but he only broke the ropes after what, church? After the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. See, I think we have this idea that Samson was just a strong dude that he was Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone or The Rock, that he was always just strong. But what I see in Scripture is he was only strong when the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. And so maybe he was ripped and built like The Rock, but his strength came from the Lord. May we never forget where our strength comes from. And, and so as he breaks the ropes and he realizes there is some trouble, he's looking for a weapon. And I'm going to guess there were branches. I'm going to guess there were rocks. I'm going to 
guess there may have been other things. I know there were ropes because he just broke them. I'm going to guess there were other choices. But what did Samson opt for? Of a dead thing. <clears throat> Samson found a dead thing. And he went over and he picked up the dead thing. And he starts swinging the dead thing. And he wipes out a thousand Philistines. And after he wipes out the thousand Philistines, instead of getting down on his knees and praying and giving thanks to God, instead of giving glory to God, Samson whips off this song about himself. In fact, if you paid attention to the words, the real words, he said this, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them up in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. It's about me. And you can almost see him, see him holding his jawbone. And like after he finishes the song, he like just drops it. And the scripture goes on to say, it actually points out when he finished boasting. This is not just a song. This is not a, a psalm like David would write to give honor and glory to God. He's boasting. And then the story goes on. And we see that Samson meets Delilah. Most of you know this. If you don't, I'll give a very quick recap. Samson meets another ungodly woman, a woman named Delilah. He falls for her. Uh, he, he develops a relationship with her. And she tries to trick him. Uh, the, the Philistines want to get rid of Samson because he keeps on whooping their butts. And so they want to get rid of him. They go to Delilah and they say, look, whatever his secret is, you've got to figure it out for us. We don't know the secret, but you got to figure it out. So she goes to Samson and says, Samson, what's your secret, baby? I love you. Tell me your secret. And Samson says, oh, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's this here. And then Delilah acts on it and finds out that wasn't the truth. And, and, and then Delilah comes again a second time. She says, see, you don't really love me. You don't really think I'm beautiful. You don't really want to be with me. If you did, you would tell me. And he's like, all right, all right, all right, all right. It, it, it's actually this thing here. So Delilah acts on it, and that's not it either. So she comes a third time and she says, look, you don't love me and I'm so, I'm so embarrassed and if you really love me, so this time he finally breaks out. He's like, all right, all right, all right. Here's the deal. I'm not supposed to cut my hair. I'm not supposed to cut my hair. And so Delilah takes that secret back to the Philistines. While Samson is asleep, she cuts his hair. And that's going to lead us to the conclusion of our story, which, by the way, do you remember the way Samson's first relationship ended? With a woman who tricked him into giving an answer. And who has he fallen for? A woman who has tricked him into giving an answer. Have you noticed that sometimes people have patterns of falling for the same type of person over and over and over again? and not learning that that type of person is the wrong type of person. I don't know if that will speak to anyone today. So the Philistines finally come to get Samson. Judges chapter 16, verses 20 through 22. And then Delilah cried out, Samson! The Philistines have come to capture you. And when he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Isn't it interesting how Samson thought to himself, doesn't matter if the Philistines came. I will do what I always do. And when he got up to try to do what he always does, he discovered that the Lord had left him. This time the Lord's spirit had not come powerfully upon him. And I will just tell you that in my opinion, this may be the saddest verse in the Bible. It might be the saddest verse in all the Bible for two reasons. Number one, it's sad because the Lord's Spirit left him. 
God forbid that His Spirit should leave us. Lord, take not Your Holy Spirit from me. Humble me. Help me to follow You. Help me to pursue You. I don't want to know about You. I want to know You. I want to be in relationship that Your Spirit would always dwell with me. And I think sad also because Samson didn't even know it. The Spirit of the Lord had left him and he didn't even know. Which really forces me to ask some questions about Samson. Did Samson love the Lord? Was Samson a godly man? Did Samson actually walk with the Lord? Or is it possible that the Lord was using Samson for his own purposes, even though Samson wasn't a godly man? So I just ask you, church, are there examples in Scripture of where God will use ungodly men for godly purposes? Can, can we see examples in our own time of where sometimes God will use ungodly people for his own godly purposes? Yeah. You can look at churches that are in stadiums this morning. 75, 80,000 people gathered up in a dome stadium to listen to a preacher tell them lies. And so we can't just assume that because things look like they're growing, look like they're good, look like they're strong, that they are. Notice verse 22. Interesting verse. But the author chooses to include it. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Why is that in here? Why do we need to know that it wasn't long before his hair began to grow again? Is it encouragement to other men like me? <laughs> that it is possible. <laughs> it may grow back. No, I don't think that's it. I think it's in here to remind us of Lamentations 3.23 that says to us, not only is God faithful, but his mercies are new every morning. And every morning, Samson's hair began to grow back just a little bit more. And it wasn't his hair that gave him power, but it was his hair that was symbolic of God's power in him. And aren't we lucky to have a God who is so patient and long-suffering that every morning his mercies are new, that every morning his spirit is growing a little bit more in us. Let's wrap this thing up. Judges 16, 28 through 30. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. So he, he's, he's chained up. Uh, he, he, his eyes are gouged out. Uh, he, he's been mocked and made fun of. The people are laughing at him. They're having a banquet. They're celebrating. The mighty Samson has been defeated. Right? It's like if the Bears ever beat the Packers, there would be a, a great celebration. And in verse 28, then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Samson is identifying something here. The Lord, my strength, my power came from you. And I'm asking you to not forgive me, but remember me again. This is a form of repentance. This is Samson humbling himself before the Lord and repenting. And he goes on and he says, Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. And with one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple. And pushing against them with both hands, he prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. And so he killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. Samson repented and said, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. Lord, return to me. And God, who is good and patient and long-suffering, remembered Samson, and he returned to Samson, and he gave Samson the victory, although Samson did die. And while I don't know, I suspect that Samson met the Lord in glory on that day. Some final conclusions as we bring the worship team up here. 
Some of these might be a restatement of things that we've already talked about, but I want to make sure that we glean a few things. First of all, if you're a Bible scholar and you're like, I, well, I didn't come here today to hear about Samson. I know Samson's story. Let me just give you a couple of cool things. What is this? Do you notice that Samson and Israel, uh, they have these parallels? Like Samson is sort of a, a, an analogy for Israel. I'll tell you a couple of them. Both Samson and Israel, they were born through miraculous means. Right? Israel uh, was born to old Abraham and, and old Sarah. And it was kind of a miraculous birth with these old people. Samson had that same kind of a birth. Did you notice that um, God took things that were weak? He took weak Israel and he took weak Samson. And he made them both strong in his power. Did you notice that Samson and Israel were both given a code by which they should live? For the Israelites, it was the law that God had given them. For Samson, it was this Nazarite code. And each one was supposed to separate them so that when the rest of the world saw them, they would say, there's something different about you. You kind of stand out. You're set apart for the Lord. A lesson that we might take out of this today is this, that people who love the Lord are not controlled by their desires. They are controlled by the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside them. People who love the Lord are not controlled by our desires. Yes, the honey looks delicious, but it's off limits. Yes, yeah, she is beautiful. She's off limits. Yeah, that weapon seems like it would be good. It's off limits. And, and I, I really want to touch on this. Samson's identity was not in the Lord. Samson's identity over and over was in himself, in his strength, in, in his cleverness, in his clothes, in what he could do. Samson's identity for most of this story was not in the Lord. He didn't understand who he was in the Lord. That's why he always had to be the center of attention. That's why he always had to be the smartest. That's why he always had to have victory. He always, always had to win. Because he didn't understand who he was in Christ. You'll also notice and hear this now. I know it's a long time, but young people hear this. Samson was a loner. He was a loner. What friends did we read about? Samson had what friends? We didn't read about any friends. What other Christians did Samson surround himself with? What other believers were there to help Samson walk through life and uphold him and keep him faithful and strong? What other Christians? He didn't have any. Everything Samson did, he did on his own. And furthermore, not only did he not have strong Christians, but he turned to ungodly people. His first fiance, Delilah. We don't have close godly relationships in our lives. We make ourselves vulnerable to the things of this world. Samson did not honor God or give glory to God for his accomplishments. Samson did not thank God for rescuing him over and over and over again. And here's the final lesson. It's got a couple of subpoints, but the final lesson I think is this. Samson was sent to rescue Israel, and you know what we see? We find out that the world needs a better rescuer. The world needs a better savior. We don't need Samson. And then a little bit later, Israel's going to want kings. And so they get Saul, and they get David, and they get Solomon. But the world needs a better king. The world needs a better Savior. Praise God that he sent Jesus. Amen. That we might have not only a better, but the very best Savior. That we might have the very best king. Because Jesus, too, had a miraculous birth. Jesus, too, was given incredible strength, although his strength was over disease and demons and wind and rain and thunder and death. Jesus, too, was betrayed by someone who acted like a friend. Jesus, too, was chained, tortured, and put on public display to be mocked. Jesus, too, died with his arms outstretched. Jesus, too, when it looked like he was defeated, defeated the enemy. But unlike Samson, who was chained up for his own sin, Jesus was chained up for your sin and for my sin. 
Church, I believe there's lots and lots and lots of lessons to learn from Samson's story. I hope the Lord has spoken to you. I can tell you that he has spoken to me this week. And I guess I would just end with this. Praise God that he's given us a better Savior. Praise God that he's given us a better King. Because Samson and David and Solomon Saul and I don't care who you want to pick President Biden, President Trump whoever you want to choose none of them none of them can save us only Jesus can do that would you stand with me and sing giving praise and glory to our great King and Savior